very warm welcome to all of you. Let's have a small quiz first. Uh, does anyone know how old Kotak Mahindra Bank is? Any guesses? Yes, please. Is that correct? 21. We got, we got a license in Yes, very close. Yeah, 20, thank you. 2003, we got a license. Yeah. Although I think uh, the bank started as a financial services company in 1985, right? Yeah. Uh, they started this company as a financial services company. And of course, uh, I mean, all the group companies started, so Kodak Securities, Insurance. Kodak Bank is actually a much newer entrant when we got our banking license in 2003. And then we started the first branch. Uh, yeah, so it's about 21 years uh, that the bank has been in existence. Yeah. Uh, so Rohit, you have been an FMCG veteran for a very long time, and then you transitioned into the banking sector. I would like to know how is your vast experience in Unilever is actually helping your approach to influence the marketing in banking sector? So look, I'm a very accidental banker. As, as very good friend of mine, Anoop, I possibly followed a similar journey as him. So I've, I've, I was with Unilever for about 25 years and I joined uh, Kotak last year. So I've been with the bank for about a year and a half. Uh, what really struck me, uh, you know, as I've been in this journey and of course when I was interviewing for the role, the remit that Uday, Shanti, Manyan, Deepa gave to me was the fact that how do you bring consumer centricity into bank? So that was the brief and honestly I didn't really know why was that so important? Because when you work in a, in, a, in a consumer goods company like Unilever, you almost take that for granted because that's the way you're kind of trained to think. You always start uh, from understanding who my consumer is, what is his or her needs, how do I really you know, build the right product propositions to them. And then I joined banking and I realized that the first message which one of the senior leaders told me in the bank was any banking product can be copied in 24 hours. And therefore, there is no differentiation in banking. And I think that's really set me thinking because what I realized that banks, in my view, and many financial institutions are, operate from a, very supply, from a very supply side of thinking. I have made a product. Let me go and find a consumer to whom I can sell it to. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm harping on the word to whom I can sell it to. Versus what real consumer centricity is, what I call is the demand side of thinking, that you first start from identifying who is the consumer I want to speak to. What is his or her needs? What are his or her pain points? What are his or her aspirations? How do I, what are the emotional insights which drive this person in his life? How do I then build a product proposition which answers his or her needs? And then I find a distribution mechanism to fulfill demand. And I think this is a shift that we have been trying to bring in, in Kotak is to shift from what I call a supply side of thinking to a very demand side of thinking. So every conversation that we have is starting saying, do we know who are the key segments we want to focus on? What are the, the key needs of those segments? In, in, you know, and therefore, once you understand those emotional needs, how do you then build a product which answers those needs, but more importantly, is differentiated from competition? And once you've built a product proposition which is differentiated, then role of marketing is to build awareness to that, and then role of distribution is to service the demand. Uh, and we're trying to move away from where distribution creates and serves demand both, to marketing and product creating demand and distribution servicing demand. So they, that's really the, my, what I'm trying to bring from my years of experience working outside banking to banking. Uh, as I say, I, I find a lot of conversations in, in the industry very thought-provoking because uh, you know, and my, my main job is to keep on bringing the voice of consumer in everything we do in the bank. Yeah, very interesting. Huh? And I really like the accidental banker thing. Yeah? So I would also like to know, uh, how do you integrate your marketing efforts in, you know, across various funnels? So look, uh, you know, there is top of the funnel, there's bottom of the funnel. And I think there is, as I was telling you the other day, I, I think there is, a, uh, there is a big debate which you're seeing a lot of new gen companies and, and as we're going into this world of digital, uh, we are actually ignoring the, the whole role that top of the funnel plays. Uh, I kind of see the whole consumer segment is like a big, uh, you know, ocean, you know, so it's, it's, it's a big bucket which is filled with water. It's a, it's a leaky bucket, you know, so as you're doing performance marketing, which is bottom of the funnel, you will keep on removing consumers from the bucket. If you do not fill in more and more consumers into the bucket, after some time, there'll hardly be any water left and therefore trying to take out water from a 
empty bucket is going to really be expensive. And that's really, I see the role of top of the funnel and bottom of the funnel. Top of the funnel role is to just build awareness about your brand, about people should know your brand. There should be high spontaneous awareness, there should be high top of the mind awareness. Uh, you know, they should know what the brand does. They may not even be thinking of buying it, but they are aware of the brand. And bottom of the funnel is all about when you're reaching out to where customers with a very customized proposition about that particular product, which, which may be relevant to them at a point of time where they're thinking of buying that product. Uh, the, the, the fact that you built awareness about the brand combined with the product proposition at that point of time helps you convert that person at a much lower cost. So therefore, the two play a lot interchangeably and, and uh, interlinked with each other. And I, in my view, the way we really look at that is that we want to make sure that we have a clear target for spontaneous awareness on the brand. You know, today, uh, we kind of benchmark ourselves with the, the other three top private sector banks to SBI, which is, which is the, the, the biggest public sector bank. And we are much lower than all these four banks on awareness. You know, of course, we don't have as many branches as, as these banks have. We're not distributed in as many places. But our goal over the next few years, we want to double our spontaneous awareness so that you know, if someone wants to open a bank account, if someone wants to take a financial product, Kotak should be one of the three banks that comes to their mind or one of the three financial institutions that comes to their mind. So the first goal is basically making sure that we build spontaneous awareness on the brand uh, through what the brand stands for, through specific product propositions. Uh, so that's really what I call is the above the line advertising. And above the line doesn't only mean television. Above the line would go into digital as well. Above the line would go into print as well, would go into outdoor as well. But the idea of above the line is to build awareness about the brand. And then bottom of the funnel is what I call is the performance marketing. You know, where uh, you, you, you find customer segments in channels where they are, where they are and you reach out to them with a, a shoppable ad where you know, they can take an action on that ad, they click, they go into a journey which helps them convert that awareness into conversion. Uh, and, and the way we then measure is that how much we're spending money on building awareness, is awareness increasing? How much money we're spending on building conversion? And are we able to convert at a lower cost? Uh, and if the two happen together, the two will happen together only if you're building awareness, and then you'll be able to convert at, at a lower cost. So we've got metrics at, for everything, and our metrics are about building top of the mind awareness, spontaneous awareness, image attributes, and on the bottom of the funnel, basically looking at the cost of acquisition uh, and the return on investment that we do on, on below the line. Would you, like to share, <coughs> would you like to share your media mix as well? Uh, no, I won't. Uh, uh, no, I mean, that's, that's, that's internal metrics, and I wouldn't want to do that. But, okay. but I think the larger point I'm trying to make is that we are well spread out, and we, have, we are sufficiently well spent both above the line and below the line. It's not that we are, uh, we are shifting monies all to below the line. We are actually building a lot of money to, to build the brand awareness above the line as well. Yeah, very interesting insight, in fact. Uh, Rohit, I would also like to understand what role does data play in your marketing strategy? So, uh, you know, data and the new language of data, in my view, is artificial intelligence, AI, ML, whichever language you may want to call it, plays a very, very big role in the way we look at uh, our entire, not just marketing, but entire running, how we run the business. So, what, what I call is, uh, we, we built a whole data uh, team into two, two pillars. One is called the data compute, and one is called the data consume. The data compute is, is, is built by, or is filled with, uh, you know, the, the data scientists, whose job is to build algorithms to really be able to, you know, drive meaningful insights for users of data. So for example, uh, you know, you, you have a credit algorithm where you want to decide that people who apply for a credit card, who are more credit worthy than less, someone who's credit worthy, what is the kind of limit that you should give to that person? Uh, you know, if a person, based on his uh, spending habits and repayment habits, whom do you think could potentially become delinquent consumers? And therefore, if they were to become that, how would you, uh, you know, take an action? That? So, so we're building algorithms uh, to really answer these questions. So this is the data compute team. And then there's a the data cons consumption or data consume team, which works very closely with the product and brand marketers, whose job is to ask questions to, these, to this data. Uh, you know, so I want to build a proposition for affluent consumers. So looking at how affluent consumers uh, use different financial products with my bank, I can build insights around, you know, what, what, where do they spend their money on? 
you know, is investment a big role for them or is spending a big role for them? And based on that, I can then build customized propositions for that particular uh, customer segment. So that's really the role of, of uh, uh, the, the data consumed team. And I can actually give you a, uh, and I love this example, so I can talk a bit more about that as to how this goes across the value chain. So let's take uh, a simple category like a credit card. And uh, you know, you're, you've got, you, you have an early jobber who's, who's still yesterday studying in a, in a good college. He was living on a stipend uh, paid by his parents and therefore he was constrained in the way he's spending. He's got his first job. He suddenly started to earn money for the first time. Uh, of course, in like all good Indian kids, we would take some gifts for our parents. But after that, he wants to spend. And uh, you know, he, he's, he's basically toggling between or he's torn between the whole space of I really want to enjoy life because the first time I've got money with me, but at the same time, I, I kind of want to be preparing for the future. So how do you really give him a proposition which kind of balances there? One product which does that very well is a credit card because credit card actually helps him maximize his spends while giving him a bit of a credit for that. So he wants a credit card. Now he applies for a credit card. The, you know, the, I need to have data about him. Sometimes I have his credit history, sometimes I don't have his credit history. Based on the data algorithms that I've built, I need to be able to decide whether he's credit worthy and I want to give him a credit card or not. So let's say if I've given him a credit card. Then the product guy decides what is the right proposition to be made to this guy. Is this a person who really likes a cashback? Is he a person who likes discounts on particular products? Is he a guy who shops a lot for fashion and therefore a Mintra Crow Bandit card may be a good one? Or is he a person who really uses a lot of fuel? Again, you look at his habits on data and, and decide what is the right proposition on the credit card to offer to him. And then the marketing guy takes over and says, okay, I need to build a communication for him to be able to buy my card over the other 20 cards which exist. So is he a person who's driven a lot by functional reasoning or a person driven by emotion? Does he want to be seen as the guy who, who, who thrives himself by taking a, a deal in his group? Or is he a lot about uh, you know, functional savings that I kind of have? So based on that, you personalize communication for him. So now he's bought a card, he's using it, uh, and then the product, uh, the product owner again comes back and says, okay, he's not spending enough on my card. I want to make him spend more. Therefore, now you look at data and identify what are the right offers for him? Which, what are the categories that he's spending more on? Is he spending a lot on Amazon? Is he spending a lot on quick commerce? Is he spending a lot on entertainment? Does he love to travel a lot? And therefore, what is the right offer that I can offer to him that can make him spend more, but at the same time, you know, uh, you, you know not, not go out of, out of limits? Then the next, you know, so, so he's selling well and, and the car's doing well. But a credit card sale is not completed until you get the money back. And therefore, the collections guy wants to make sure that the guy is paying back. In many cases, you can predict based on his spending patterns who are the guys most likely to become delinquent even before they do that. So if you already know that this guy is most likely going to default, what is the kind of communication that I would want to do with him so that you know, he doesn't default? I may want to go and tell him that, look, you don't spoil your credit history because it'll be difficult for you to get a future loan or a card. Or I may want to tell him about the fact that you know, you've bought a bike with that money, you don't want to lose that bike. There are various ways, but if I understand his, his, his insights based on the data, I can actually build the right collections message. So this is the this is example. This is how I tailor my communication. Right from, I mean, this is where data helps me at every level. Uh, right from defining the right segment to what is the proposition for that segment, how do I drive usage on the product, how do I drive collection on the product. And that, for me, in my view, is the use of data, which is not just about marketing. Marketing is a subset of that, but actually being able to influence every element of the product chain for the business. Yeah, Rohit's team is actually tracking every move of the customers, right? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, consumers, you know, expectations are also changing rapidly, you know, depending on the age, geography and all. How do you ensure that your services remain relevant? So, look, uh, I think the way I kind of look at this is that, uh, you know, role, the consumer's needs will always be varying across, you know, life cycles. It's, it's how the times are changing be living in a more digital era, less digital era, uh, you know, therefore the needs will change. But as a true marketeer, as a good marketeer, your job is to basically understand the changing needs and be able to customize your product propositions to, to that customer. And I'll give an example of one uh, product that uh, we, we, we built a lot last year. So you've seen interest rates are at highest ever, uh, you know, for, for many years. Uh, and 
you would realize that if interest rates are very high, people would not keep their money in savings accounts. You know, all, all the money would be kind of either used to buy uh, high yielding assets, etc. But we realized last year that 65 lakh crores still lying in savings accounts. That's a huge amount of money. And then we went to try and understand that why is that the case? You realize that Indians have actually grown in from a very uh, a, a era of, of scarcity. And therefore, there's an insight that I don't know if what will happen to my money, I want to keep it safe. And savings accounts is one of the places where, where people kind of keep it safe. So, so, but at the same time, you would wonder that why would they not put the money into a fixed deposit, even if they want to keep it in the bank and not put at risk in the equity market. But, but somewhere, consumers believe that fixed deposits are fixed and don't have liquidity. And that was the insight that we picked up that how do you really balance the liquidity need of the consumer with high interest of an FD? And we, we, we built a product called the Active Money, which we drove aggressively last year uh, to kind of give the consumers the liquidity of a savings account with the returns of a fixed deposit. And just understanding, you know, we've had that product for many years, but we never drove that product because we didn't have this insight. So once we understood this insight very clearly, we were able to tweak the product proposition and made it more relevant to the consumers, and we did handsomely well on, on driving, driving that product. So I think, for me, it is more about you have to be one step ahead of consumers in being able to anticipate their needs. And once you anticipate their needs, how do you then build customized solutions to kind of answer those needs? So that's the way we, we kind of look at everything we do, whether it is a product, whether it is tech, whether it's a journey. That's, that's the way we, we look at uh, everything in the bank. Yeah, I, th I think even I keep a lot of amount in my savings bank. I will have a rethink over it now. So now the last question, with the rise of you know, fintech disruptors, what strategies do you employ to keep your bank at the edge? I think for me, there are two parts of it. One is about being relevant in terms of being able to answer the needs of consumers. I think that doesn't change. I think what fintechs have done in many industries have done a better job than banks at being able to meet the needs of consumers. And I think a couple of industries which, which, which have been very, very evident to us is the space of payments, you know, where uh, no bank really realized that how, how big this could become. Uh, and, and you saw what Google Pay or, or Phone Pay have actually done in this industry where about 90 percent, 85, 90 percent of the share is, is between three players uh, who are, who are non-banking players. Uh, wealth management or, or investments is another category where fintechs have actually been able to do a better job than banks at being able to drive uh, penetration of uh, SIPs and mutual funds and, 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 and stocks and trading. So I think the learning from there is that how do you make sure that you understand your consumer needs better? So that's something that is, is a clear uh, you know, eye-opener for us and, and something that we have to work harder at doing, which is what we're really doing. I think the other thing which fintechs have really brought a big shift in the industry, and it's not just fintechs, it's actually every uh, D2C company, as I would call it, is the role of technology in actually delivering a very seamless and easy to use and simplified user experience. Now you imagine 10 years, 20 years back, all of us have grown up going to banks with our parents, you know, and if you remember, remember, there would be like a person sitting behind the teller with a cage in front of him. You would kind of get a token, and after like 20 minutes, your token will flash, your number will come if you want to deposit money or you take money. You have a statement which you will go to the uh, person and he will fill the statement with hand. After some time, dot matrix printers came and he started printing. But a, a visit to the bank was like a half day affair. And then you want to shop online, you want to shop from a blanket or a or a Zepro today, you can get stuff coming to your home in 10 minutes. Uh, you want to order a car, it, you can do that very easily on, on a Uber or, or an Ola. Now, all these in the tech companies have changed the way consumers look at any product or services being bought. So I want to get a haircut done, I call someone from Urban Company Home, I have stopped going to a salon because it's just so easy to get someone to come home and, and, and cut your hair. And bank, you have to appreciate that banks have to operate in the same consideration set. And that's really the role of, for me, the biggest shift that banks have to do is to change the way they look at tech to drive user journeys which are simple, easy, and, and, and no, no longer cumbersome to use for the consumers. And really getting the user experience right is, I think, the big shift we have to make. Building products and propositions are relevant to consumers doesn't change. That will remain for you for life. But this is the big shift that I think fintechs have in a way, taught banks to really, really pivot and drive technology in a very different way. Thank you. Very interesting insights, in fact.